everyone this is Pradeep from Sydney kicking off yet another session of GCC GCC episode 19 and what is GCC GCC is global chapters and connections the global engagement platform of IIT Delhi alumni a platform which aims to make it a value-driven proposition for any alumni to connect with anybody else all over the world. And whom do we have today? Well, normally you have three amigos, but today we've got four amigos. Oh man, and which batch are they from? They are from 1977 batch actually i should be saying five amigos you know but then i have to go on to say six and seven because i can see a couple of other people from 1977 batch also over there anyway whatever it is a very very happy morning evening afternoon night whatever it is in your part of the day and let's kick off the session today and let's go alphabetically and we will first go from sydney where i live we will go to Germany and whom do we talk to? I am delighted to introduce Amardeo Sarma. He is one of my batchmates and one of those people who flew overseas immediately after they finished IIT Delhi. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Amardeo. Amardeo let us know what did you do once you finished IIT Delhi? Well, once I finished IIT Delhi, I had basically three options. One was uh, to go to IIM in, uh, in Bangalore, where I had admission. I had also admission to a couple of universities in the United States. But I also had the, uh, the option to go to Germany, which was, in fact, a little more difficult in some ways. But my personal connection is that, as some of you might know, my mother is German, so I've already, I've always had a strong connection to Germany besides India. Now it's the other way around. I live in Germany and have a strong connection to India. So that was one of the options that I thought I should try and take. It was a bit more difficult because the education system in Germany is slightly different. So I had to spend about six months to get my degree recognized. I had to do two courses again. Uh, because this was not considered to be equivalent. So I could start at uh, the level of a bachelor's to go on to do what was what is equivalent to master's, which is uh, in Germany, the diploma, you know, which doesn't, which you don't have anymore because that's been changed to the universal system. So I suffered a bit because of the lack of coordination between the two systems, but still I did manage to uh, continue and then I did my studies and then stayed in Germany. So, guten Morgen, Herr Sirma, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Ja, ich spreche auch Deutsch. Ich sprache wenige Deutsch. <laughs> so, for everybody else's uh, this thing, if Amadev had said one more word in German, I would have backed off. But coming back to, if you had not gone to Germany, would you have gone to US or would you have been in India? What would have been your preference at that particular point in time? I think at that particular point in time, I would have stayed in India and have uh, my second choice would have been uh, the IIM in India to go that direction because I've my my general inclination was to combine research but also management of research. So that might have been another option for me. So you are at the moment general manager for NEC Labs in Europe. So you work for a Japanese company, your heart is somewhat in India, but you live in Germany. So how do you manage all three of these? Well, I think it's, it's a huge uh, opportunity and actually a challenge to be connected with more than just one country. And I think it's also enriching in many ways because you get to see that uh, in other countries, things work differently and open up, it opens up your mind a bit to different ways of thinking and looking at things. And I think that's all, always been uh, very, uh, very good. And I think I've made, uh, I hope I've made good use of that. 
to uh, to get you get to talk to people in Japan. But beyond that, of course, through the uh, European and international projects and standardization that I've been involved in, of course, talking well beyond that to people in many other countries as well. So I think uh, this global mindset is something that is uh, something I can encourage others to follow as well. Hey, don't steal my company's name. My company's name is also Global Mindset. So now, jokes apart, what I want to know is that this was a textbook example or a textbook reply that I love, you know, the opportunity of loving, you know, all the three countries, languages, cultures and all that. Uh, I will come back to the challenges of these later on, but let me ask you, what do you do as general manager of NEC Labs? What does NEC Labs do in Europe? NEC Labs in Europe is one of the two non-Japanese labs, the other one is in Princeton, that does core technology research. And the areas that we are responsible for overall is things like uh, 5G, now 6G, uh, security, artificial intelligence, and uh, the Internet of Things as well. So these are kind of uh, frontline things that are of big interest to NEC as a company. Uh, from, from its history, it's been more a communications company only, but uh, it's been moving more towards uh, the new areas of applications and artificial intelligence clearly is a huge opportunity. And maybe we'll get to talk a little bit more about that. There are also many issues around artificial intelligence that are kind of also coming up in re regulations that uh, also hinder AI research, for example. So Amartya, you mentioned all the popular acronyms, you know. But you missed out one, Metaverse. Are you also doing work in Metaverse? No, not not directly. I'm I'm following it, but not in, no, involved in that. Not a problem. Let me ask you that we are living in a world where data is the new currency. How, what do you think that are people really aware? Or are they very easily giving their data away to the big tech? What are your thoughts in terms of what value is being attributed by people to data? I think there are two answers to this. One is, of course, data does have a huge value, which we can see in applications coming up all over the world. Like even if you buy something from Amazon, they know immediately what are your other preferences and things like that. So big data and even personal data is something that's being used uh, by many companies. But the other side of it is that it can not just be used, but it can also be misused, which is also one of the reasons for the regulation in, in Europe with the GDPR. So many people, that's the other side of the coin, that many people are not aware that when they give up um, control of their data, that uh, they also lose some of the control of the way things happen. And um, the importance here is to get a good balance between, on the one hand, using the opportunities of data, but also preventing its misuse against the people without them actually knowing it. So this it's in this balance uh, that GDPR came up. We might think, I, I think to some extent, maybe it's been overdone a little bit, but on the other hand, it's a very legitimate thing to do. But we need to find a, and strike a good balance between the usefulness of technologies, but also usefulness of using data and the potential to misuse it. And this is going to be, I think, a, a problem that's going to be with us for a long time. So, Amar, what is GDPR? That is the, um, the uh, General uh, Data Protection Regulation um, that has been agreed in Europe, has been passed as law. Um, it's three years ago now that it's been passed as law, and uh, each of the countries in the European Union are required to follow it. Before that, we had a situation where each country had its own rules, and it's been harmonized. It's also a benefit for business because you don't have to adapt to 27 different laws, but you have one law under which you fall. So GDPR is quite prescriptive. It is, in fact, uh, supposed to be one of the toughest data security laws all over the world. And it is taken as a kind of a, um, you know, highest level of a benchmark for data security and privacy. Now, do you think compliance with GDPR comes in the way of being innovative? Well, I think on the one hand, GDPR does provide 
new opportunities on to provide secure data services, for example, to provide services that protect you against misuse. So it opens up new um, areas in, on the one hand. But on the other hand, it does, especially for small and medium sized enterprises, um, add a lot of overhead, uh, which big companies are easy. They can handle it pretty easily because they have departments that look into that. But it's more the small and medium sized companies that are affected. And I think more could be done to make sure that these smaller companies are able to cope with data protection as well. So to some degree, I agree with you. Some of it has been overdone, but the general principles of GDPR, I think, continue to be valid. So in Australia, 47% of the economy comes from small to medium business. What is the percentage in Germany? Any idea? Yes, it's much higher. In fact, it's, it's over 90%, I would say. The small and medium sized companies are have a play a very big role. I don't know the exact number, but it's definitely well above what it is in Australia. So are we saying that the major component of the economy has a big overhead and they are just kind of using resources in terms of complying? Or are they even the driver for innovation in Germany? Well, we are looking, I mean, the European Union has put up a huge program to, um, to leverage the uh, capacity in all of Europe for, uh, for, to make sure that even these uh, rules like GDPR and many other new regulations that come in are not only to the detriment of uh, Europe, but also provide new opportunities. And uh, this is also in the context of especially the United States, which is very strong in, in the data side that um, the European Union is looking for a lot of alternative opportunities through its research programs that it set up. And there's a lot of uh, um, projects going on there. And we as NEC in Europe are also involved in many of these projects. So I don't just see it as GDPR as you know, just hindering uh, research and business. It also opens up new opportunities. It's just that I think it might require some amount of adjustment uh, to benefit smaller and medium sized companies. So I also understand that you are one of the founders of a movement in Germany, which basically later on went on to become possibly a European or a global movement in terms of skeptics and skeptics, skeptics especially from science perspective. Now, where did that come about? Was it from the time that you were in IIT or was it something which came about when you went to Germany? And what is this movement or association that you started? Well, this goes back, in fact, long before IIT even, when I was at school, um, I remember one, one day when the morning I read in the newspaper and asked my dad about it, there was an astrologer who said the world is going to end in 1991. So I was, as a, as a young kid, pretty much scared. And I already read at that news, uh, newspaper that there were some people who criticized that. They were called rationalists in India. And there was a guy called Abraham Kuvur who was involved. Later on, I went on to read books, popular books like Erich von Däniken's book, but also the Bermuda Triangle from Charles Berlitz. And uh, so these impressed me a lot in the beginning. But after investigating the real background of this, I found out that I was being fooled. And when I came to Germany, I saw that happening in many other areas as well. And at that time, I had uh, read an article in, uh, the, in Scientific American by Douglas Hofstadter, who pointed out that there is an organization in the US called the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. And so I wrote to them and um, they wrote to me, if you were, would like to start up a German, German group, you can do so. And I had a group of 20 people who started it off. Um, and that's now become a, an organization of 2000 uh, people. So that's what I've been doing as part of my voluntary work because of my interest in science since I was a kid. And um, my, my being upset about being fooled a couple of times. So I just wanted to make sure with such an organization that we have enough information provided to the public so people can make up their own mind and are not fooled. And I didn't want other people to be fooled like I was as a kid because I had no orientation. My parents didn't know too much about that. And I had to look up the data myself. 
So I think that's been the other side of my life in Germany. So I I appreciate the fact that you know you really data is uh, or you know inference or or data science is something that you really focus on or depend on. But what about the big tech? You know how are they using you know data for that matter? Or going on another level altogether what is artificial intelligence after that you know what you are doing is you are just mining data for certain trends now what are the limits to this ai at one end we've got the positive side yes and what about the other end where we are talking of potentially ai taking over you know our lives so what is the right balance but right. i think one of the big problems with ai in general is um what ai is very good at it can tell you given a lot of input what is the best um, how can you optimize the output so you can make some very good decisions based on the input data that you have which can be a huge amount of uh, data the problem which has been realized in uh, i think this is worldwide is that you don't actually understand how the machine learning algorithms make their decisions so it could be discriminatory it could be wrong in some cases as well even though the general correlation between the input and the recommendations made are correct so because of that one of the new areas that have come up is called explainable ai uh, in which we are as nec strongly involved for example and the idea behind that is that you just don't want to understand that the uh, algorithms work but you want to understand how it works what are the basic reasons why certain decisions are being made this is extremely important in the medical area if you want to for example propose a therapy and you say based on this data this person should have this this therapy and you're blind as to why it has made these decisions a physician is not going to be very comfortable in in providing that sort of therapy but on the other hand if the uh, if you have enough information as to why these algorithms have made these decisions because of such and such factors in your health then the physician has a much better confidence in being able to apply the results as well this might go a bit at the cost of uh, efficiency but you're much more into understanding why these decisions are being made and that of course raises the trust level which is extremely important um if you lose the trust in such systems whether it is uh because of security uh, pri- um privacy breaches and things like that or whether it is because you are coming to discrimination you might lose the confidence in the technology and the technology might take a huge setback so investing at the right time to making sure that these things are settled is very important i think in other words what you're saying is that we don't want to see just a black box but we want exactly. to know what is happening inside the black box Yes but what is happening in reality in the industry at the moment So in in uh, there's a lot of um, um there's a lot of services being provided already today but at the same time uh, there are the, these concerns that are coming up uh, again and again so for example uh, we are working in uh, NEC to provide um the correct kind of vaccines for example to use in the case of cancer we are working on things using machine learning and and artificial intelligence in coming up with the best uh, kind of combination of vaccines which could also be applied in the case of uh, things like covid-19 and corona and so on so there's a lot of potential here but i i see we are still at the research phase so there's a huge potential there but if you don't solve the problem of gaining the trust of those who are going to use it later we are not going to be able to you know make make a business out of that but i want that doesn't doesn't answer others. that doesn't answer my question what is happening at the moment are we seeing that are 50% of the companies you know letting us know as to what are the algorithms doing or is it 10% of the companies or is it 90% of the companies no in fact today most companies do not tell you what exactly is happening behind the algorithms not only just because they don't want to 
but but they are not able to because uh, they have we are not uh, as advanced in the research as we should be to be able to explain how these results come about there's a i mean if you look at any of these algorithms that you look whether they are in amazon whether you use searching search engines or anything else there's a huge amount of intelligence behind them and very often they come up with the right suggestions and now that may not be that critical so that's fine but if it becomes uh, critical such as in the case of uh, estimating how likely is somebody going to be when it's a judicial case, like in the case of the US, where, where artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms predict how, how likely it is that somebody is going to, um, to become criminal again, and so decide on the amount of years somebody stays in jail. Then it uh, encroaches into a lot of uh, issues that uh, we need more explanations about. So I would differentiate very strongly between simple services that don't affect um, human rights in a way as much and those that do affect human rights. So we need to differentiate between those two. So on another level, some of the people from the audience want to know about some use cases for 6G. So what are your thoughts in terms of 6G and some potential use cases? So one of the interesting things that we're looking in the um, context of 6G is uh, which many many other companies are also looking into is reconfigurable smart uh, surfaces. So you have in addition to the antenna and the receivers, that's just one aspect. I mean, 6G is a huge field. So we can talk maybe an hour or two about it. Um, so what we're looking at is how can we have intelligent surfaces that reflect uh, um, radi uh, reflect electromagnetic waves in a way that uh, they can be more optimally configured and you can uh, have a bigger reach, for example, with the new 6G frequencies, even um, obstacles like buildings would stop, uh, uh, stop the waves from reaching the recipient. So if you have reflection areas that can you know, reflect these waves, you can achieve a much better um, overall uh, efficiency of the overall system. So that's one of the things we're looking at. The other one, uh, which is also very important already in 5G, is, um, is how you use concepts like slicing so you can provide different levels of services to those who need either uh, high throughput or fast response. So they open up a lot of new opportunities to configure the network in such a way that it can be used by a wide ver variety of users, not just telecom users or those using it for automotive, but you know, generally broadly from um, distributing um, videos up to making phone calls and having videos like this one to having fast responses where you need it, such as when cars move and uh, they need to have understand whether there's an accident ahead or not. So there's a huge range here. I, and I think with 5G and especially 6G, there are going to be many new questions coming up that open up uh, new research, interesting research questions. So Somnath Mitra is asking that, can I transport food over internet? No, we're not <laughs> going to be do, able to do that, of course. But if you ask, uh, some things you can perhaps use communication to optimize maybe supply chains or something when uh, so you can use it indirectly certainly not directly so last question is that we are at the moment in different phases of 5g implementation all over the world and it will take about you know another seven to eight years because uh, 5g becomes a norm globally when do you see 6g coming into play i don't see it coming into play as such before let's say the end of this decade so it's going to take a long time. So it's now the time for research and preparing. I mean, we'd be very happy if we had 5G in place all over the mm. place. And that's not the case yet. So I think that's clearly, from a business point of view, the priority to have 5G put in place. So 6G is when we start looking at what's the next generation of stuff that we can do. So in other words, it's the same point uh, where quantum computing is at this particular point in time, potentially. Would you say yes. that? I would say so, yes. With quantum computing, we of course don't know exactly how, where and how fast it's going to go. Yep. So I was just reading yesterday or two, two or three days back of a breakthrough by IBM in terms of quantum computing. But it's been very, very fascinating and I would love to get you back to talk more about you know, the 5G and the 6G 
because there is a lot of curiosity at the moment because with uh, you know a lot of big tech going into metaverse one of the building blocks is going to be the telecom protocol you know, because 5g and potentially 6g are going to be one of the building blocks for that so this is absolutely a fabulous discussion and folks i'm just cutting it off in the interest of time please give a big round of applause to amardev and as we go forward we will also be reorienting gcc in such a way that we will be getting knowledge sessions and i'm already putting your name down against 5g stroke 6g thank you so much amadev and i will circle back to you after this call to pick up the threads in terms of you know getting you more engaged in gcc bye for now and have a lovely day now we move across alphabetically to the next person of the same batch so one guy went to germany although he said that given the choice and if germany was not an option he would have possibly remained in india well let's look at somebody who remained in india and went on to iim ahmedabad and he is one person who was with one company for all through his life post i remember but so who is this guy this guy is chitranjan dhar please give a big round of applause to chitranjan dhar chitu how are you i am pradeep thank you very much for inviting me to your session and uh, look forward to interacting with you and others so today. what did you do after iit delhi well you... i'm not really a one company guy i'm a two company guy <laughs> fabulous after i am after i am i joined uh, telco that tata motors then called telco in pune myself sunil batra uh, we were all uh, ajay badru mathur three of us i thought uh, we joined telco and uh, uh so telco when you joined you had a bond of 2 years so the moment the bond got over i skipped and joined i am in the bond and the reason wasn't that i was dissatisfied by telco in any manner because there was a lot to learn and sometimes i regret that i didn't spend more time there but it was because everybody was convincing that unless you do a management degree you won't earn enough to even get married so uh, so that was the real motivator so in other words you Potential. joined ima just to get married almost oh. earn money and then get married chitu so tell me with itc and itc is a company which the whole stock market is just keep talking and talking and talking mm -hmm. and why do they talk about it is because sustainability inclusive sustainability so right. itc is the largest cigarette manufacturing company in the world right but at the same time it has gone into quite a few other directions fmcg lifestyle and so on and so forth so i would be very keen to hear about your thoughts of inclusive sustainability well let me first clarify about itc till about 76 it was almost exclusively a cigarette company and when i joined the company it was about 90% cigarette 10% with the rest as things stand today i on a top line basis itc is about 45% cigarette and 55% rest and the rest includes fmcg it includes paper includes packaging includes uh, uh, elements of agri business very very large elements of agri business so uh, if you see the universe of itc today and also it sorry it services if you see the universe of itc it has it has expanded in several directions almost making it look like a conglomerate uh with certain fixed ideas and that's how it is maintained through governance sustainability in itc let me tell you in 68 itc took a turn with this first indian chairman mr haksar who was very convinced that uh, if itc went the way uh, the british companies were being run in india it would have to close shop very soon and therefore he started the process of in 
Indianizing the company, and you know, the the suit culture gave away to the bush shirt culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what became very important in the DNA of ITC was the pride in India, and this continued on. And uh, finally, our last chairman, Mr. Deveshwar, not the current one, the one before him, who expired in 2019, and an alumni, 11 years senior to us, uh, he really had this entire thing, India first, as an example. And part of India first is when you explore, and since you're in multiple businesses, a lot of which which uh, which you know touch the heartland of India, and the poverty that exists in India, and also a lot of it has to do with the fact that environment is uh, uh, issues which were coming to the fore in the mid 90s when no people were not recognizing it. He wanted to be an ex- ITC to be an exemplar. in the issue of sustainability so one of the things he he kept in mind in 19 mid 90s just after he took the chairman is that uh, itc as a company despite whichever business it gets into must be carbon positive it must be water positive and must be solid waste positive so these three positives he really kept in mind and i'm coming to inclusive but a little later so Uh, a lot of work that happened in itc and keeps happening in itc as we go along is really directed towards sustainability work is directed towards making this a constant reality as a matter of fact in these three goals we've achieved about 15 years back so we we return to the earth more water than we consume uh, we uh, give back i mean convert sequester more carbon uh, than the carbon dioxide which we generate and we utilize more waste in our processes than the waste we generate so it's been a is a, a a constant struggle and that's where our sustainability journey really started around the time when csr was getting and itc was one of the first companies in csr much before it became a mandate and the reason for getting into csr was because a lot of our work was in rural india so we started uh, the whole thing was about how do you you see itc doesn't have the money to change india i mean none of us are under that stupid assumption but we certainly have the ability to set models which if a large, large government or large companies or large people follow on their own can set in uh, into motion things which are of relevance to india and to the poor poverty of india for example our whole thing about how do you uh, how do you reduce the stress levels of water in farming how do you double the farmers income through uh, whatever work you do around the farmer whether it's in agricultural yield or uh, livestock breeding or the like then how do you uh, uh, how do you grow forestry cover in a rural area which actually uses a lot of wood for its own firewood so a lot of these things started Uh, ITC engaged with them in in across uh, a large uh, part of India, across about fifteen sixteen states. Uh, by the way, including I must say in the last seven eight years, a lot of work on solid waste management. So, so we started in uh, talking to civil society, putting up projects, doing work across uh, about fifteen states in India with large emphasis. I would say in Andhra, in uh, Telangana, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, the and now West Bengal, little bit in Bihar. Uh, so these are the areas of focus as to how we can get to a more inclusive existence for our farm. I'm talking about the rural poor, not so much the urban poor, but more about the rural poor. So in our entire sustainability search, what can we do? to not only make it environmentally sustainable but making lives more sustainable and more uh, lives uh, you know giving a lot more joy and positivity to people who live in this country fabulous by setting examples fabulous so that's me not for you could be the poster boy for itc man but no, no. <laughs> jokes apart no, no. now tell me that you right. you mentioned that you know the revenue breakdown between different divisions of itc is so radically different from what it was many many years back 
Right. How big is the food division within ITC? Is it twenty-five percent, ten percent, hundred percent? It's not obviously well, not hundred percent. in 100%. terms of net turnover, I think it's getting closer to about twenty-five now. Twenty-five, twenty-five percent. Yeah, it's getting towards it, but twenty uh, to twenty-five now. I mean, I would say closer to twenty, not twenty-five, is it? So, in 20, in in third. rupee terms, how much? How what is the size of uh, the business? We are not supposed to be revealing that, but uh, no, no. But I mean, this is you are a public uh, uh, listed company, so whatever is even. No, I know, but uh, we don't we don't we call uh, FMCG is all listed as one entity. But uh, suffice to say that it will be, it is. Uh, Somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand okay. crores. Okay. okay. So when you took over as the chief executive of the food division, mm-hmm. and if I recall reading that article in Economic Times, it was two thousand and nine. Yeah. At that time it was doing about one thousand seven hundred crores. Right. And by the time you left the food division, it was doing six thousand eight hundred crores for revenue. Right. So, what did you kind of just, uh, you know, smile at people and kind of rub your chin, and this happened, or how did this happen? No, I can't claim to be very strategic because uh, I always realize one thing: you do small things in life, when they work, they become strategies. If they don't work, then you forget all about it. So, uh, but fundamentally, there were certain things to be followed, and uh, it had to be done through the infrastructure. Our whole focus was on. Delivering to a customer a better experience. So uh, when he consumes products of ITC, so whether it's in terms of uh, nutrition, whether it's in terms of uh, indulgence, or whether it's in terms of uh, of convenience. So on these three planks, what we tried to see is that is it possible that we strike a golden mean when we give all three to a consumer in the same product? So it does. It is extremely nutritious. It's extremely indulgent and it's extremely convenient to consume so but uh, it's not that it was ha- it happened with everything but working our, our basic focus was on product and quality and of course consequently there was a lot of emphasis on brands and how do you need to build brands and how do you uh, ladder your brands and uh, therefore how do brands support each other and uh, therefore a lot of marketing work more than that, we also increase our distribution a lot, uh, across to uh, various multi-channel distribution. So, Chitu, you are yeah. what you are doing is you are painting a very wide canvas. Let me right. now come back to specifics. Did right. you take market share from other your competitors? Did you, you grow to, the market? Had, what did you do? You had to take market share because the market existed. We were the last player. Okay. We, are, we were the last player on the block. So we had zero share when we started and uh, virtually zero. And therefore we had to take market share from everything. So uh, our objective was that we will not exist in any business for more than five years if we are not at least the number three in that business, ideally number two, number one and number two. So we had to have aggressive strategies for taking market share from our customers. There was no doubt about it. But, uh, how these were implemented were through hundreds of small actions. I won't say there was any a Eureka moment, I would say, that, you know, got out of the hot tub and started dancing on streets and said, oh, I found it. <laughs> a lot of, lot of, lot of those small, yeah. small things had to happen well. And consequently, when they happened well, they became good strategies. At least now I can say they're good strategies. <laughs> Love uh, it. Love it. Fundamentally, in any business, you would see... Uh, it is all about management by walking around. It's all about doing the small things well. It's all about breaking every uh, every every problem into bite-sized problem which 50 people can solve bits of rather than one silver bullet. Because the moment you start looking for silver bullet solutions, you stay where you are. So how Love do you it. optimize Love it? it? How do you problem solve it? So, so that, in, that other really words, in other words, walk the talk. In other words, you are focusing yeah. on to micro deliverables, but let right. me ask you that do you have any examples where you created new markets? See, of course, in uh, different products, we did create different markets, but more, mostly I would say what uh, we did in terms of our sales or uh, creating new markets 
a lot of our emphasis was on rural India, a lot of emphasis. And uh, whether in Uttar Pradesh or Madhya Pradesh, uh, especially the Bimaru states, we penetrated uh, a lot of our products, the simple things like even biscuits or noodles or, uh, you know, uh, products of that sort into areas where uh, people were not going. And uh, so uh, in that sense, we created new markets. Um, I'm also talking about certain product development issues of combining categories. Like we had a product where it was a combination of biscuit and chocolate. For the first time, it became a rich biscuit chocolate kind of mix. So those are market segments which we did create and which uh, are thriving today. But uh, or, or even say a thing like ATA, okay, where ITC today is a clear market leader. So uh, we use the advantage of our uh, agri-business. Uh, agri uh, ITC uh, is the second largest procure, procurer of ATA in India. And we procure out of the infamous mandis now which you're talking about. But we procure out of at least 200 mandis in India. And we procure about 2 million tons. Now this is nothing compared to what government procures for FCI, which is about 35 odd million tons, but largely out of Punjab and Haryana. So uh, what we realized very early in the day is if you have to succeed in a commodity like Atta, we must be able to convince people that Ashirwad Atta is a superior Atta. And therefore, the most important thing in convincing is consistency, year on year on year. So the kind of branding that was had to be done, the kind of, so you buy about 200 varieties of wheat and blend them so that the sum total remains same year on year on year. And one of my greatest joys was, uh, uh, and one day I got a complaint from a customer saying that your heat quality is deteriorating. And this is a complaint in Bangalore. And uh, when we inquired into it, and we saw the pack, we noticed that she was consuming a wheat which is normally not sold, Ashirwad Atta, which is sold in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Rajasthan, or most of North, which is got the North blend of Ashirwad Atta. And there were traders who were using arbitrage because that's a little cheaper than a southern brand. Who was using this art arbitrage, getting that ATA down to the south and selling to the southern uh, consumer. Interestingly, it was rejected by the consumer because they could also make out the difference in taste and take out. So between two Ashurvads itself, you could, because there was an Ashurvad north and an Ashurvad south. Similarly, there's an Ashurvad west and an Ashurvad east. So how do you educate the consumer? How does he experience it, achieve rather, in this case? Uh, it became a terrific story when people thought that commodities actually have no chance of being branded because there is nothing you can do offer in a commodity. But if you focus on quality as your benchmark and get down to the basics of quality, yes, needing time and whether does it does the, does the dough turn black and many other things. So there were tests for all those parameters and a lot, lot of research happened in all those parameters, you can actually deliver to what the consumer needs. So you were also chief executive for the lifestyle division. Right. Now, were you getting free shirts and all that when you were CEO of the division? I wasn't supposed to, and nor did I get. Uh, I must tell you, it was a division which I did. Of all my 40 years in ITC, the business I enjoyed the least was that. Because as you know me, I'm not one of those clothes people. So, <laughs> and nor am I very fashion forward. So that's a business I did not, I did not vibe with very well. Okay. And you know, you're suddenly those crazy designers coming up to you and saying that let's tear it from here or let's fray it from here. Say, Why? It's looking nice. Why would you want to do that? So uh, I always believe that a chief executive, uh, Big Shift can talk a little more about it. He's also into it into some lifestyle existing. But as a chief executive, it, it's imperative that you vibe with the business you are in. I did not vibe with the business, and I must be very frank. It was one of my bitter experiences in ITC. Fortunately, I was able to uh, uh, with the, withstand the storm and do something else uh, later on. But uh, yes, it was interesting because you had, uh, while you were, I was almost 48, 49 when I was of the business 47 48 i had all 25 years and 20 year old working around so and, there's uh, a their life. fabulous so there's yeah. a question from the audience from sunil mishra and sunil um chitu is 1977 batch the right. question is that what is uh you see you said that 
IT is virtually operating like a conglomerate. Right. Um, even though it is, you know, multinational, so as to say. Um, and uh, most of the Indian business houses operate like mm. a conglomerate, you know. Right. Mm. So what do you see as the future of the business model of operating like a conglomerate? Of operating conglomerates in India? Yeah. See, there is basically, if you look at India and many other developing economies, what is the reason that there is, uh, while in America conglomerates don't succeed or not succeed, and they say, okay, if you want to, if you have interested in uh, FMCG and, and cigarettes, invest in Marlboro and invest in Procter & Gamble. Don't, why do you want the two companies to do it? India is a com country which has a lot of institutional wealth. A tremendous amount of institutional voice. And I mean by institutional voice, even reaching a place like Munger in Bihar or uh, Danapur in Bihar exactly, or upper UP or, or a village in Andhra or Telangana, which is actually like infested. It is not possible for a company to build five value chains and six value chains to reach the country. So if you got, there are a handful of companies, not handful, there are more and more companies which start, have filled in these institutional voids, which are which are there because of lack, lack of liquidity. And because of this, conglomerates are able to do well and thrive in this country, whether it's in terms of banking, it's in terms of regulation, it's in terms of sustainability, it's in terms of customer relation, it's in terms of shared knowledge, and people in IIT would know that, or it's in terms of attracting of talent. So uh, when you look at it from that point of view, we don't take a multinational view, I think. We do take a more national and holistic view. But I do believe over time, as India progresses, which it is quite easy, there'll be less and less, and, and, and most companies will start splitting in, 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 in their own form. So there'll be a tobacco ITC, there'll be FMCG ITC, there'll be hotels ITC, or whatever company they take, so some business will hire off something. But till such time that there are these institutional worlds which exist, it makes most sense because it enables a delivery of the service at the lowest cost. This is my take on the subject. And I've, I've struggled on this for quite a while. Okay. This is an interesting topic and I might pick you up on that later on in one of the, uh, you know, the thought leading sessions that one I'm planning. But last question for you in the interest of time is that you are also a member of the Corporate Management Council. This looks like, you know, the China... China's Politburo or something like that, you know. <laughs> so were See, you also, just... was your role also just to kind of, you know, smile and nod when your chairman says, you know, yes. So you also say yes. Very, most certainly. But, <laughs> okay, an IDC system of governance is threefold. One is the board of directors. Hmm. And the board of directors has three executive members. That means there are three employees of ITC on the board, the rest uh, 14 or 15 are either independent. Or, so just below that, the people who run the company uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is a corporate management committee. So last five years, I was a manage, uh, I was a member of the corporate management committee. So that, therefore, you really get, it's like a board in the sense, and you get into the inert and the details of businesses, presentations are made to you, plans are approved by you, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, know, you may choose not to, uh, I mean, you can't too long be a passive member because then you are out, <laughs> generally. But uh, it is like any other board, but it's not the board of directors. Some amount of statutory responsibilities, which are the judicial, which are in the realm of board, okay, about uh, how, how they handle the shareholders, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't evolve here. But certainly the day to day, which is about profit, about turnover, about profitability, about human resources, that is the responsibility of the company. So it's really strategy execution. So ladies and gentlemen, we had the first guy who airlifted himself to Germany. And here we've got the second guy from the same batch who went down the corporate path. And uh, it'll be interesting to see that how much money both these guys have and whether the ROI really kind of panned out or not but jokes apart let's give a big round of applause to chitranjan dhar thank you thank you and uh, i i'm very delighted just my last word 
to meet all my contemporaries and colleagues here, especially Amardev, who I remember more as a musician than as a top-notch researcher, which he's turned out to be. So, Actually, so thanks to you, Pradeep, we were able to meet. But you else. are absolutely right, and you know I wanted to pick up on the music aspect because in in IIT days, Amardev was more known for his music than for his research talents. You know. <laughs> so, as it seems, then I wanted to pick that up, but we will pick that up when I call him for 5G and 6G, you know. And just in the interest of time, I had to cut it off. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Now we go across to the third person from the same batch who went into academics. So, and I suppose the question to Amardev also would have been because he spent a lot of time in research, uh, collaboration between industry and academia. And that path is, you know, a bit you know, similar to academics. The only difference is the academics operated 100,000 feet, uh, the research organizations operated 50,000 feet, and the industry is actually on the ground floor or even in the basement in some cases. Uh, but please give a big round of applause to Professor Kushal Sain. Man, I didn't realize that I have to address you as Professor. I always used to <laughs> call you as Kushil. So Kushil, tell me what made you go for an academic career? Like, did you kind of always had that burning desire that I want to teach and all that? So uh, I would say that it just happened that way. Uh, we all uh, had spent five years somehow graduating nicely uh, from the IIT. At that time, uh, I didn't really think that I would actually be teaching, uh, though although we loved whatever was being done in the classes. Uh, but it so happened that uh, we had one senior to us uh, who was in electrical. Uh, Umesh Gupta was his name. And so uh, in his last year, somehow he uh, he was probably at the end of the day, he was department in rank three and uh, he got a PhD in electrical engineering, admission to PhD in electrical engineering department directly after undergraduate uh, completion. And uh, we, we happened to talk to him at once and he says, well, this is a very good idea because a lot of things can be done when you are actually at IIT and uh, compared to whatever industry you go to. But we did manage to go to an industry uh, I and one of my other friend from the department uh, in the summer after uh, the undergraduate completion. But around the time when, when we were really enjoying that part, whatever little time that we had, uh, we got an offer from IIT that you can also join PhD if you want uh, without doing a master's program. And considering Umesh Gupta was a very happy guy at that time, we thought it's not a bad <laughs> idea. I love that response. Yeah. I love it for all the joys of uh, education. Now, tell me, you were a textile engineer, but somehow you seem to have made a very big name in education technology. So, how did that happen? That's also a quite interesting uh, story in the sense that uh, IIT Delhi had a center called Education Services Center or Educational Center where uh, we had a studio and there were some faculty member who were engaged in doing certain work and one of them was professor kl kumar uh, who was from applied mechanics he had uh, taken some training in the education technology and was working in in, in that area and it was a first workshop which was done uh, by him and another colleague uh, uh, of his for all faculty whosoever wanted to join for the workshop to say, well, the, the teaching uh, could be done better if you have audio visual aids. That time, almost everyone was doing chalk and talk stuff. Uh, and the chalks were also very dusty. And at the time, by the time you come out of the classroom, <laughs> you were all white, more or less. Uh, then, then he conducted a workshop for two days for many faculty members. And uh, there were a lot of faculty members who were very senior to him, professor. And he had a tough time convincing people, uh, look, uh, using audiovisual aids is a good idea in a classroom, starting with an OHP and then later on various kinds of things. 
but at the end of the workshop he said that other than thing you can make uh, videos and i am giving you assignment uh, make a team of two i make giving an assignment whatever topic that you want uh, you make a 5 minute film and we'll help you make the 5 minute film you make your uh, you know storyboard and so on and so forth uh, whichever area you want to go go to your lab and then we will come with a camera one and one of my senior professors at that time uh, he later on became director of iit bombay and he was the chairman of the iit board of iit roorkee together we said okay, we will make a small little film and then that was so interesting that i got stuck that i should be actually doing uh, making films like bringing the you know outside world into the class and maybe teaching so we had we made good number of films for national handloom development corporation short films we used to go to industry take the cameras there uh, look at the processes bring them back edit and that became pretty interesting so i got into this because of that particular workshop that so which, really... which year was this you see because why am you know kind of very surprised is that in 2020 or 2021 you know of course today we now talk in terms of you know having a highest level of engagement through immersive technologies or using vr ar but in the last couple of years it's been more about using video as much as possible from an engagement perspective but you seem to be had doing this for almost about 20 years back so which year was that well uh, this portal workshop probably was uh, even 5 years before that so that time i was just a faculty who, who just wanted to use this technology and i started loving this but once i became the head of the education technology center itself then i had a lot of opportunities not only doing but engaging people also and that time we realized that a lot of work was being done at different iits uh, they were making video lectures being recorded in the studios but as it turned out that almost all the five iits that time uh, they were all doing recordings in some like areas of electrical engineering some area of computer science a bit of a mathematics some mechanical based on the interest but if you look at looked at all the courses that together they were there you could never make a complete uh, program that was the time we we were making vhs cassettes then we started making cds or dvds and then you know giving it to various colleges so that whatever people teach here they could also share of course there was some little cost there but that was the time when probably all around the thing people were talking about why not do a composite thing where all the iit is actually collaborate and do a complete follow up uh, so that was around 2000 let's say uh, one 2000 actually around that time we were having some national projects and we were involved that time that uh, if you have the video content why don't we project it uh, broadcast on the television so there was a transponder uh, which ignu was handling and they had uh, they wanted a 24 kind of a seven channel they wanted us to contribute we started contributing from 2001 about 6 hours of video content in in that channel and in 2003 uh, the iit is thought that we have enough content so we can actually have and we were invited also that you can do a 24 seven channel also that you have enough content which can run continuously as the as the video protocols of the broadcast protocol is you're never supposed to stop even for a minute and a blank is called a bad thing in television which we never do working 24/7 in in various studio environment making sure things happen itself was the challenge because you always thought you can always go for a cup of tea you know you, you can stop but the, the the broadcast and channels they never stop they're not supposed to stop 24/7 means 24/7 kinds of things we learned and people were making uh, videos from different iit they used to come to us iit delhi was linked with ignu and we were sending uh, our material from iit delhi to ignu uh, uplinking center then through the satellite and then it was broadcast uh, all over and so so there was a emergence of what we call 
called at that time was Eklavya, Eklavya Technology Channel. So we are talking of 2003, somewhere around that time. Right, 2003. So at that time, we had a 24 by 7 channel, which That's was giving right. a kind of free quality education. Absolutely free. Uh, the only thing is you got to have some way to just download it. Like you have a dish antenna or something, you can download unencrypted. So there was no uh, tracking or there were no fee. So how fee, many fee. subscribers did you have or how many people used to take advantage of those? That remains a big question all the time, even today. Uh, like like Doordarshan is, is one of those such channels which is called free to air channel. So those who are encrypted channel, they can actually count. Hmm. But roughly, uh, we would say that because of publicity, that ministry was involved because all that was with, with the help of uh, the Ministry of Education. At that time, we will call it uh, MHRD. That uh, publications, uh, pamphlets, newsletters, magazines were going to all colleges advising them this is simple you can adopt this either in your college itself or advise anybody else to do that so the, the numbers kept on increasing and uh, how did we get to know is that there were queries coming that i am not receiving this or we have got a problem here can you uh, we did not receive your magazine this time when are you sending that all that because it started coming because so so we thought uh, there are numbers but actually counting was always a difficult one. Even today, it is very difficult in an encrypted free to air channel. And uh, you will probably be surprised that we are actually, from education point of view, that Eklavya finished uh, later on when the INSET 3C actually finished its services. But today, we have 34 educational channels running from Gujarat and uh, various types of video programs of various colleges, starting from almost class one to the PhD level programs are being run uh, on these so what would the number of people using this would be running into thousands millions of what what ballpark i'm not looking for an actual number or something like right that, so it, it should be it should be close to fifty thousand to one hundred thousand at any given point of time depending upon who and uh, what what kind of audience we if you look at only engineering you may be finding less higher education but at the school level, starting from class one to class 12, you, you can have a large number of channels. There is a channel, today it is called IIT PAL. This is IIT Professor Assisted Learning. This is IIT PAL, which actually is for class 11 and 12 students on physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology. And the queries that they come because they are monitoring through uh, this particular channel after being broadcast also gets available in the YouTube as well. So people do ask questions from different groups. Uh, and, and that particularly says that the, the channels which are catering to lower classes, they are really uh, attended much more than the engineering one. So for the engineering, we found it is the web-based system, uh, which finally we call it as NPTEL, National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. That became the cornerstone for actually reaching out to all the adults. So because see, to a certain extent, uh, Kushul, when I look at that, that is also linked with the evolution of the web in India. Hmm. Absolutely. And now, but but uh, what I find is absolutely amazing is that in 2003 that we were leveraging education technology for democratizing quality education, which is I think absolutely fabulous because I was not aware of all this. I mean, all I know in Australia is that 2013 was what I call as the year of the MOOCs, and 2014 was what I call as the year of the backlash against the MOOCs. Hmm. And so when did IIT Delhi move on to MOOCs and were you involved into that? So uh, before uh, we went on to do the MOOCs, around the same time when the Eklavya was started, because there was a funding given by the ministry for running the channel 24-7, you had, the, had to have people working 24-7, you know, encapsulation of the material and so on and so forth. 
But we also simultaneously started this national program on technology enhanced learning, where the video and web courses were being asked, we were, were being generated. Video was going to the Eclavia, web were generally available as such, as a text material also. As at later stage, what we found was that the bandwidth situation became quite interesting in India. And uh, from 2003 to 2014, all right, we were generating both video and web courses in almost at all major disciplines, whether elective courses or core courses or humanities, sciences, engineering sciences, engineering arts, all courses which require to complete a degree. With a collaboration of all IITs and ISC Bangalore, we were actually uh, doing enrichment kind of environment. Like you had a lot of courses available in the text form or in the video form, also through the web from 2003 to 2014 without any certification, just learn. This was also very useful because we used to get admission to the postgraduate students, you know, after the exam of gate, you would call them for interview uh, before admitting. And the faculty would ask, you know, typical, very twisted questions. And suddenly they found that after some years, students are actually answering all those questions, which are supposed to be twisted questions. So what are you doing? You know, how did you know this answer? This is a very nice answer. You say, this is NPTEL available. This matter is available. Material is available. NPTEL. Thank you very much. So we were very sure that this was useful. In 2014, as you say, that around the world, the MOOCs was getting a bit of a negative publicity. We started the certification program in 2014. And till today, we are doing it. And uh, the some numbers that I can actually share from the NPTEL impact point of view is, so we have about 3.7 million plus YouTube subscribers. Wow. We wow. have something like 52,000 plus hours of videos in English language sub with subtitles close to 2300 courses courses means that you have a 12 week course or a eight week course or, or a four week course if it is a specialized course those kind of numbers actually are there and so when we started in 2014 we had in that year we had only three courses for MOOCs and something like about 1 lakh, 1.12 lakh people registered for the these three courses and about 3,000 odd applied for certification and gave exam. You must agree uh, that there is a difficulty in taking exam. Therefore, we decided from the beginning that the online examination will be a proctored examination. Wow. Assignments can be uh, but no, wherever you are, some assignments are given. So about these days, we give about 25% weightage to assignments, which are given every week. 75% weightage to the proctored exam, which happens at the end of the course, uh, online, but proctored. And today in 2021, uh, the number of people who registered for various courses, and the courses were to the tune of 1,028. 33 lakh plus people registered for the course and 5 lakh plus appeared in the exam to get a certificate despite the COVID and every kind of difficulties that you had. Some, we had to actually postpone some of the uh, exams because you, you couldn't get centers where you could go and proctor them. So this has become very important because uh, the colleges actually like these. They, they are telling the students to work around, join the courses. Uh, today, about on an average, if you look at it, 76, 75% are the college students who, who take these MOOCs courses. 19% are faculty and about 5% are people from industry. That is actually the statistics which kind of quite, you know, match up to what the global numbers are. That the majority of the students tend to be from uh, the higher education system, you know, who are using it. As I'm only talking at the moment of the engineering, what we're doing from the NPTEL point of view. Uh, because from the government point of view, this MOOCs 
which now is under the uh, earlier it was a general project called the NME ICT, which is National Mission on Education through ICT. And today there is another term which is called Swayam. You know? So all these projects now come under the larger umbrella of Swayam from where the funding comes to these, these kind of things. So there's some, Nawal Jaggi is writing in the comments that were you also a warden of Nilgiri Hostel? Absolutely, I was oh. the warden of Nilgiri Hostel. Oh. Uh, I mean, I, I, almost all kinds of uh, administrative positions I have held, except being the director and deputy director. And, and did you have some curly hair at that time? Uh, well, not really curly. Yeah, some, a bit of a curl. Yeah, sure. Okay. No, there are hardly so any... My memory, <laughs> so my memory is correct. My memory is correct. I was there that time in Nilgiri. <laughs> so so, so we, we know each other a little better than that, right? <laughs> so, so now I have to cut it out, but I must get you later on for this session because this is really a very, very uh, interesting story. Now, wasn't Eklave the guy who was asked to, you know, cut off his thumb by his teacher or something like that? Isn't it? That's right. Absolutely right. But in this case, <laughs> there was no cutting of the thumbs. You can retain your thumb, enjoy life and study as much as you can. Oh man, this is such a lovely story. I mean, I can't believe it myself. I was not aware. I used to wonder that what are IITs or India? What is happening in MOOCs over there? But no, yeah, just, is... just, before, just before you go, let me just tell you, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the program, as I said, uh, you know, it is expected that the government of India has done a calculation as to how much work they will do from till 2025-26. The data that the, the charts have come up and the funding for all that is being, you know, sideline so that it can be dispersed every year. So in, in various forms, like Swayam Prabha is one, the MOOCs are one, and the MOOCs is not just IIT, right? Now UGC has its own, AICTs are, NCRT has, and the Open School, all of that is going on. So there's a lot of work in, in this area is happening as far as the government of India is concerned. So one of the some of the questions which come to my mind is what about the bandwidth issues and all that? But I have to stop now in the interest of time. But this is absolutely fabulous, and I, I also put you down for a later session. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to you know, Kushal. You know, absolutely fabulous to have you and look at the story. And we now move on to the last person, but who is not the least, certainly not the least, when it comes to Kirti Sanon. And I thought that her name was Kirti Salon. But then somebody corrected me and said, no, 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 it was Kirti Salon. And I can tell you that that post got the maximum number of likes and from all social media platforms. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Veer Dixit. Another guy who from IIT Delhi went on to IM Ahmedabad. And from being a management consultant, later on became an entrepreneur. And of course, we will ask him that, you know, where, how did Keithi Sanon fit into his entrepreneur venture? So, Veer, where are you? Yeah, I'm here. Very much. So, man, how many white hair do you have? How did Keithi kind of, you know, take a liking to your boots here? Hmm. So tell me, so what made you go into the entrepreneurial journey? I mean, you could have got into a very comfortable corporate job like um, our friend Chitrajan Dhar, your class fellow and my class fellow. And, you know, you could have also become some chief executive somewhere. Why the rough and tough of an entrepreneurial journey? Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the question, uh, the way you post it is that uh, the entrepreneurial journey is rough and tough. Uh, well, is it? Uh, you know, is it? Um, okay. Uh, so, when I finished IIT, I, in a way, had several choices. Uh, I had a job with Chitranjan Dhar in Telco. Uh, I had a, a scholarship to go to Cornell. And uh, I got admission to IIM Ahmedabad. And the, it goes like this, that my personal choice was actually to go abroad and pursue engineering, 
because I thought I was inclined to be an engineer and a scientist. Uh, but I had this, this conversation was there in my family with my father a year before that. He's the one who encouraged me to take the IM uh, exam, actually, the CAT. And he says, uh, you know, these are the new institutions and you should, uh, you know, kind of try to get an ambition there. Um, and I thought I'm not the management type, so might as well do it. My father will be pleased and, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll say fine, that's okay. So the condition I put was that is quite clear. I uh, I want to go abroad to study uh, engineering, but if I get into I am Ahmedabad, I shall relent because it's the top. So, so as it so happened, it all just happened that way. And I said, Chalo, chalte, let's go to IMA. When I finished with IMA, uh, so there was this uh, a professor of mine, uh, Dr. N.C.B. Nath. Some of, uh, I think there's nobody here from IMA at that time. So um, he set up a uh, consulting firm a year or two before that by the name of Foundation to Aid Industrial Recovery. Uh, the idea was to take up, uh, you know, at that time uh, there was a lo lot of sick industries in the country. And uh, the sickness was for a variety of reasons, including poor management in some cases. In some cases, uh, simple stealing of capital by the entrepreneurs, but it, it was it was a widespread issue. I mean, there was socialist time; things were not, uh, what should I say, not efficiently run. So he was recruiting for his uh, firm, and he was my professor. He used to teach, I think, a course called uh, PEM or something, Public Enterprise Management or something like that. He was uh, so he had he was a person who was actually who was in levers and was a very young director in STC, sale and places like that. Um, so the question, why did I opt for a job like that versus a corporate, uh, was quite clear. Uh, I had uh, done my summer training in Telco, in IIT, at International Harvester, one of the, one of the you know, you know, Mahindra Group companies in IIM. And I thought if I get into a job like that, you know, you go there in an ocean, you just kind of hang around and you're one drop there and one, one small thing chugging along. It, it just didn't excite me enough. Uh, so I said, let's try something else and at least it sounds, sounds interesting. So I spent a decade with Dr. Nath. Uh, we were actually 10 of us from IMA in my batch who joined him, four from a senior batch. We were a team of 14 people and uh, I, I mean, uh, I was there with him for 10 years. Uh, a lot of them left before me. Uh, and there was a very wide amount of uh, exposure I had uh, to industries across the board, like oil packaging, oil refining, uh, steel rerolling, you know, uh, then consulting in mining, consulting in wool. I was actually for a while EA to the uh, National Herald Chairman, the newspaper, and a whole lot of things. It was quite exciting in terms of uh, learning and exposure at that age. Uh, as things happened, I was also associated towards the last later five years with a project of the State Trading Corporation uh, to manufacture shoe uppers. So when you talk about shoe upper, you basically take off the sole and what's on the top is an upper. And in the 80s, that was a big business, big growing business. There were huge orders from uh, from Russia and GDR, which was the communist countries. And then the Western market was slightly warming up. They're not really, not really there. So, um, and it was a growing business and uh, in the exports and uh, the STC actually put this unit up because they really didn't put it up. They, so they're like, a, Typical PSU, they said the orders are huge. We are not being able to cope. We don't get enough capacity. Let's put up our own unit. So they imported a whole lot of equipment and didn't didn't know what to do with it after that because they said we are a trader. We are not a manufacturer. So we need somebody to come in and run for us. So then we, we got the contract to run that project. Um, so I was uh, I was running that as the executive head of that unit apart from the other consultants. So that's how I got um, involved with this uh, enterprise. And uh, five years I ran it, but you know, mm, and that was the time every corporate wanted to get into it. ITC, I mean, Chitu will remember if he's not here. 
uh, ITC wanted to get the levers wanted to get into it. Uh, they all did actually. Simco, Birla wanted to get into it. So everybody is making the line to get into that industry. So, uh, but the STC project was like, you know, being a parentage of uh, PSU, it was not something that was uh, really performing to its optimum level. So that's when I kind of uh, decided that this is not what I want to be doing. Uh, consulting was enough. And I, at a whim, I decided, why don't I make an attempt to be an entrepreneur and uh, try and set up a business in this territory? I, I knew how to run it. Uh, what I didn't have was the capital. Uh, and of course, it, uh, anybody hearing what I'm saying will think I'm a stupid fellow, which probably I was, <laughs> to really have no capital and get into a manufacturing business uh, back then in the, in the late 80s. Uh, so yeah, that's how I, I kind of quit and got into it. In other words, you saw a business opportunity. You It's an opportunity where you saw that, you know, through STC, you were managing it as, you know, that unit, as, as heading that unit. Um, and you saw that you could possibly do a better job of it. But when you look at the external environment, end of the day, you are talking about international business. And international business, which was very, very heavily towards uh, the earlier so-called socialist countries or communist bloc of countries, you know. Now... Uh, was that enough for you to take a plunge into that? Because that business, you know, you were already looking at times when there were rumbles happening in the communist bloc. Mm. So, was that enough for you to take a plunge? And what happened after that? Well, the 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 enough to take a plunge was the margins in the business and the whole economics was something I completely, I mean, I it, it was completely my grip. Uh, and the uh, so the what was missing was uh, was uh, was orders and and capital uh, so uh, uh, okay there was also a stream of western european uh, uh, companies coming into india looking for for uh, supply base at that time so by the bulk of the business was the communist bloc but there was uh, there was clearly leverage available in other countries too uh, and yes uh, i when I quit, I, it was my, what I felt was in the uh, short run, I will get bigger breaks in the communist uh, countries. What really happened was that within a year, uh, Russia collapsed. And so that, that opportunity actually evaporated. Uh, but then uh, the the other markets, the Australia, Western Europe, they they opened up and they were they were yeah so it, it was okay I mean, typically any entrepreneurial journey you'll have to take the risk and unless you you are in there you can't just keep sit outside and keep kind of you know thinking forever will it happen will it not happen should i do it should i not do it so my moment came then and i said let's let's try it and uh, we'll see what happens if nothing happens to yeah, no degree you, have up a stock in you are saying it very nicely to say that you know the, the your biggest market just collapsed and yes uh, australia and uh, europe etc just pick up the traction you know as if they were just waiting for you to grow up and kind of sell shoes to them my question is that's i'll come to that question but you see you also mentioned that you know what you didn't have was money or capital yeah. now in today's terms you know you've got angel vc p depending on what you know cycle you have you have a very kind of um i wouldn't call it mature but there's a fairly big ecosystem in terms of startups yeah. now there was nothing available we are talking yeah. about possibly somewhere around 1990 or something like that kind of a story 88, mm -hmm. yeah. so so what about the capital side of the story what it is like? Did it, was it like a Bollywood movie that many were you married at that time and your wife said, "Oh, here are my jewels and kind of just like <laughs> uh, Naran Murti or something like that"? You know? Hmm? No, it well, I was I was married and my my son was on the way when I was kind of preparing to quit. And actually, the month he was born was the month I quit my job. I mean, that was the last uh, the month before that was the last salary job I held. Uh, so yes, it was, and then there were no savings. You know, salaries what they were in the eighties, a few thousand bucks was all you used to get. Uh, you know, but 
the the I think what really went for me, uh, if I would say how I worked it through, is that with the extensive consulting experience I had, I realized a few things, you know, which typically what the economists talk of. So every input uh, has a cost. Okay, so every every factor of production has a cost, and the margins in the business were were skewed, you know completely towards the capital part if you if you get what i mean so the, there was disproportionate profit when once you were able to get in the 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 other factors of production so you need all you needed to do was to make deals uh, sensible deals with different factors correctly uh, actually that will be a different i mean there are people who have been wanting asking to write a case study on what i did at that time so that's a separate topic of discussion so the initial years were really built on getting together the basic capital to put up a factory and in the first three years i didn't have a factory so but i i would hire a capacity from somewhere else i'll get an order from somewhere else i'll, I'll hire you know uh, uh, contractors or somewhere else and you know kind of alchemize the whole thing and, and at the end the profit was mine because the orders were all, all mine so that's the kind of model i i worked on so different partnerships or different kind of factors and uh, get together everything so slowly then we got some capital together raised a loan there was a good amount of uh, developmental organizations who gave loans like finance companies and it was three years before i actually got a got a, a place for myself a manufacturing unit for myself uh, the the you know there was the other environmental things that worked at that time uh, you know if you were an exporter it was the income was tax free so uh, so that helps with build up uh, capital rather rapidly if you are able to, but then there are conditions you have to be the exporter you, you can't be you know somebody else can't be the exporter so there were ways to structure all these deals which is i mean hang on 10 years i only did all that consulting and advising other people how to stitch up deals so so it was it was time for me to do it all for myself yes but uh, you see nowadays the world is all about structuring and structured finance is such a big part of the economy but nothing like that was you know available at that point in time in india and i suppose another question which comes to my mind is that uh, were you still focused on uppers at that time or were had you gone into full shoes no so the first decade the through the 90s was uh, upper business growing continuously year on year handsome uh, handsome growth top line bottom line thing were all going very very well till about 2000 2001 then um, china joined wto and the whole manufacturing uh, the, the the economics of exports from india that is across all industries uh, turned on its head and uh, suddenly you found that uh, the prices were being cut and especially in a relatively lower technology area like footwear components i mean footwear is a little higher technology and more capital in, in, intensive in a lower one the prices just kept tumbling and so in 2001 or so the the inflection point was really was one inflection point that came see by that time a lot of other things had happened i mean financially i was stable the company was stable there were some reserves but uh, chinese competition uh, really turned a lot of things and uh, in fact it was bad because we suddenly lost some 80 80% of our turnover within a year uh, and it was uh, so the options were really to scale up by cutting prices and become a sweat shop after all these are this was a sweat shop operation you are ancillary to shoe factories abroad that's exactly what the business we were in so if you want to grow in a, in an area like that you need to cut prices and aggressively uh, keep the top line growing faster and faster and that didn't kind of appeal to me because uh, for, after all being a sweat shop of a much larger size made no sense you just keep slogging and getting nowhere uh, and then uh, so that that so that the, the decade the first decade of the century was a little you know like uh, trying to figure out there was business it was going it was going slowly the growth was also happening slowly not that it disappeared uh, but it was not uh, clearly not a business of the future you don't uh, stay there for too long because you don't see anything coming out of it at the end of it so the decision was to kind of move forward and integrate forward and start making complete footwear and then see what happens uh, you know to that market 
So we were focused right from the beginning, I mean, as opportunities arose, uh, to as ancillaries to safety footwear and high end, I mean, what should I say, performance footwear. We were never into the fashion or the, the you know, casual footwear. We were in the performance segment. So we decided to move into that territory of uh, safety shoes. Uh, we well, we integrated the plant. We got uh, certification to Europe, and we thought we'd probably sell again to Europe or some. I mean, the general idea was to continue to sell uh, a higher value product to the same markets. But then what happens is all these uh, WTO is one thing. China operates in one way, and but all these buyers also they are very very uh, you know territorial about their businesses in their countries. So, on paper, uh, there's a tariff, but there's a whole lot of non-tariff barriers that they start coming up with. You know, they say that, you know, they will then say, specialize some technologies, they'll specialize something else, and they will not like to uh, support you with stuff. And China was there breathing down, so prices, prices, prices. So, by the time we were, uh, I was there, and that with all that, I took the what should I say, the second most irrational decision in my life, the second time I took an irrational decision was to brand the product and start selling it ourselves. So, uh, so I'd done, I mean, the first time to quit a job and with no capital and say, let's, let's take off was the first. And this was the second where, where really I was punching far beyond my weight in terms of my, my ability to do what I, I, I thought I'd get into. So this was in the late, about 2007, 8, 9, so in yeah. other words, you see, I see very interesting story. You see, in, in the 89, 90, you see the collapse of, you know, you go into your own venture and you suddenly see the collapse of uh, the, the, the Eastern Bloc, so as to say. And then you reorient yourself towards other markets. You know the business and you know, yes, it's a profitable business. and But of course... When you make a new market entry, there are the associated efforts which are required and the costs which are required. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you go down that particular path and you're going hunky-dory. And then suddenly comes here comes in the second shock. Mm -hmm. Here comes China. Mm -hmm. And here you find that, okay, man, now it's a question of survival. Mm -hmm. So again, you reinvent yourself. You say, okay, I want to go up the value chain, you know. This is what all the Indian IT companies have been wanting to do for donkey number of years. You know, from here being labor arbitrage, they want to go into consulting. So this is what you did. You know, you said, okay, instead of you know going into from my upper, let me go into you know full fledged. But man, are the you know big guys over there globally will they let you do it? Just like what they don't let the IT companies do. Of course, okay. So you find your niche, and you say, okay, look, I'm not going to focus on fashion. I'm going to focus on you know performance shoes. But then, I mean, that's also a great story. And then again, you find that, man, again over there, I'm finding pressures not only from China, but I'm also getting these big guys who are kind of breathing down my neck. And you say, okay, why don't I brand myself? And, and then the story continues. But the question is that did you ever at these critical points feel that where are you going to feed your family in the evening? Not really. Not really. Yeah. No, it was uh, somehow it was never. Well, the point is, uh, if that would have come, that would have happened in 89, 88, 89, 90. I think by the time it was 90, 91, those stages were, had already gone past. It was like. Achha, you know, so, the bhare means, see, now this is the other thing about life, you know. Uh, the cost of. I mean, I, the, the, the money you need to get by well in life is not really too much. I mean, I think if you recognize that, uh, a lot of things in life get easy. If well, I, I definitely recognize that now I know that, you know, I can't have too much sugar because of my diabetes. I can't have too much salt <laughs> because of my high blood pressure. So I don't need anything, you know, that I know that, you know, but, <laughs> but you got your if, kids also, yeah, you got your kids also. But back then, if you add four spoons of sugar rather than one, it really wouldn't have cost a hell of a lot more of money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 tell so, me, how was the journey when you started now uh, branding your own shoes? 
especially when I look at, you know, say one is the B2B market that, okay, industrial safety and all that, which is a different ball game altogether. But I'm more interested in the story where, you know, Kriti Senon comes in, you know. So how, how Kriti Senon? <laughs> and then how, how did the motorcycle segment come about and how did you kind of establish leadership in that? You know? So it's like this. So when we did this, uh, so we did, we do safety footwear, which are, uh, which are basically performance oriented. And uh, so we have products configured for oil rigs, product configured for, for, Auto, auto, auto ancillary uh, kind of uh, units. We have products for construction industry. So that was the first port of call. Uh, and we started uh, developing a B2B business, which we do some in the Middle East and some in India. Uh, and it's a different kind of a selling. And really, branding is not a game there. I mean, it's a B2B selling, really. Uh, brand is incidental there in quite often. Uh, then we actually this is a demand that came from the market which, uh, who they said that we you know motorcycle riding is a very um, like you know you see in india the, the india is the biggest two wheeler manufacturer today you produce one and a half crores two wheelers a, a year which is bloody wow. Big. Uh, wow yeah <laughs> so um, you know uh, so uh, and then there is all segmented market. There are there are a whole lot of people that touring is a big thing. People want, you know, to go weekend touring and stuff like that. And so there are a whole lot of people who came who would come to us saying, you make all these safety shoes, very interesting products. Why didn't you make products for us? Because, you know, we just don't get the right things. The few international brands, there's an Italian company and the product was bomb and stuff like that. So we just got involved with the community and started uh, developing products for them. And uh, that uh, was received very well. I mean, uh, I think this is typical ma management uh, uh, talk. You know, you, you keep your ear to the ground, close to the customer, give <laughs> what the customer wants, and you have a good product. That's how the product actually came into being. And we, was in the demand, we said, this is what the branding game should be about. It should be centered around this because it's a pure B2C play. Uh, and uh, so we, in fact, we were part of the early companies to put into the web space. And in 2009, we had a website selling our motorbiking boots. Uh, can you get me? Hello. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can hear okay. you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so then uh, we, uh, okay, so then, but then that time doing a, you know, the things have changed a lot in this last decade. To do a consumer brand, you need to be like really. At uh, that time, the advertising was, was you know, the print, the television, the stuff like that, which is a very difficult. I mean, capital intensive. We need a lot of money. So it was uh, in the early part, uh, up to 2013, 14. We were, you know, going going slow. Though we had a website, you know, to tra get traffic there because you know, early days of Google ads, early days of Facebook, but. I was very focused on on, on uh, using the digital space uh, because that was you know relatively give you lower amount of uh, barriers to enter into a consumer market. I think that slowly got traction in the last five, six, seven years, and uh, and uh, much like Amar they were saying that there is this issue of data protection. I I mean our company has extensively used this for marketing. Mind you, I have a Facebook account. I never go there because once I once we started using this for marketing, I realized how much these guys know about you, and you just don't want to have reveal so much to them. You know, uh, it's it's useful as a marketing tool as for a marketer, but whether as a as a consumer, you want to be on the, on the other side. So yeah, uh, so yeah, we we've, we've uh, got some. I think we are uh, today the unquestioned leaders in that market. And uh, Kriti Sanan must have bought her boots from somewhere for her ride. Somebody must have recommended to her. So a well-wisher pulled out a, 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 a picture from the digital space and sent it to us. Hey, wow, see who's using it. So, kya baat hai, kya baat hai. <laughs> but which is so, so, okay. So we are at that point in time where you've got a leadership position in the motorcycle boots. But then how do you sustain your leadership position? Suppose some big guy comes in tomorrow and suddenly starts pounding up, you know, and then because brand building is always more or less a big, big people, you know, deep pockets. So what are you going to be? How are you going to, hand, you know, fend that off? I don't feel particularly vulnerable at this time uh, because there are many 
big shoe companies in this country uh, who had this opportunity staring at them they haven't they haven't gotten gotten down to you and cashing it uh, see you see eventually uh, pradeep what happens is this is one thing i think once the brand grows very large and if the, uh, the, the management is not focused well enough uh, i mean why is it that these motorcycle community had to come to be who are a small player in the game to get, get us to develop products for them and obviously there are there are specific requirements that their products need to have uh, a liberty could well have been uh, you know they could have gone to liberty and liberty could have taken the pains to do it but liberty wouldn't because they they, they don't see it as a as a big enough market for whatever reason they didn't uh, tomorrow will they i doubt i doubt well love it love it love it i just love the way you have been reinventing yourself all along the journey mm. and i will pick you up on this theme later on but you know this has been absolutely a lovely discussion mm. so, ladies and gentlemen now that we have had some beautiful discussions with four different people from the same batch who have taken different journeys and i have got number of requests from number of people to maybe you know use this session even as a way of advising students as to what kind of career professions they should take but more on that at a later time please give a big round of applause to v dikshit what a fabulous session today and i will pick up the threads again with you v so with this we end GCC episode 19 and just, just before you end just before you end yes let me just say uh, we are uh, at least after kirti you have one more client i am going to buy the shoes i used to have motorcycle i used to drive now i think i'll buy the motorcycle first i'll buy the shoes and then the motorcycle <laughs> no in fact just for information kushal is very much involved in our next product extensions of our brand i mean he put us in touch with iit some professors in iit who are we are actually working with them to develop more products for for that <laughs> utilizing it but what and i like to say you know that he is first going to buy the shoes and then going to buy the motorcycle so, <laughs> i love it i love it love it and and by the way today is the 27th of uh, november you know Bruce Lee was born, right? Mm. And I consider I consider Pradeep as our Bruce Lee, who is making sure that at the dead of the night he is awake <laughs> and trying you. to engage with us week mm. after week is just too good. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely. Big hats off to Pradeep sir. Guys, oh, we need to give him a hand. Guys, this yeah. is your energy and your passion which drives me. but this has been absolutely lovely and uh, i will be reconnecting with all four of you to get you more involved into what we are doing this is some tribal stories you know so with that it's now to the all the four amigos thank you so much for joining in and to everybody else and to lots of other people who are who couldn't attend and who said they are looking forward to watch the youtube once again a big thank you and till next time this is pradeep signing off from sydney have a lovely morning evening afternoon night whatever it is there in your part of the world enjoy your morning cup of tea afternoon lassi or evening glass of wine whatever works for you and take care well, pradeep <laughs> cheers <laughs> yes thank you bye